remember that the theme, the subject that Paul is after and the doctrines he's going to teach are very important to the love of God that we have. Romans 5, 5, the love of God was poured out into our hearts the moment we believed the gospel that Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. The love of God was put into the human heart, 100% love of God. It's produced 100% the love of God under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit, first one up, love. That's agape. That's the love of God. In context of what Paul is teaching, it's the love of God. And so he's going to talk about that. Now he's going to show you the importance of excelling in the love of God and what might be some of the hindrances and how we combat that. And he's going to do that in the, in the phenomenal system of the Greek language. And so, like Peter, when he said, when Peter said under Paul's teaching, he said, you got to put your thinking cap on in 2 Peter 3, 16. You'll need that today for sure. One of the first things you, you, you need to see that Paul did is he put the two Greek sentences with all of this Greek material inside him. He actually put them in three sections. He put it in verse 9, even though there are only two Greek sentences. He put, it, he put uh, verse 9 and 10, and then he put verse 11, and then put verse 12. And... and the writers, the translators out of Paul's Greek into the English when they put it into chapters and verses captured that when they put it verse 9, 10, uh, verse 9 and 10, 11 and 12. They captured that. We know that in the English because notice they put verse 9, 10, halfway through, they put a comma. After Macedonia, they put a comma. So, what Paul is doing in verse 9 in simplicity is to introduce his subject because the verbal, the infinitives as verbal nouns are going to push the idea of the verbs. Not the, it, and, and it's all about the subject. He's not gonna, they're not going to highlight the subject. They're going to highlight the main verbs that's pushing. Excel, ex, listen, here's what he said. I want, you to, I want you to express the love of God you're doing, you're doing okay, still even more. And so he's going to talk about that. In the second section, he's going to do that in verse 9 and 10 up to Macedonia. He's going to put a period. And then in verse 11, Paul, uh, what he does in the most phenomenal way, and I'll show it to you, he's going to introduce you to adjunctive conjunctions in the word and which is a common thing in the Greek language. It's not uncommon in the Greek language. But when you do have it, what he's doing is he's joining main parts into doctrinal ideas. Then, and, and so what he's going to do is show you, he's going to show you problem-solving uh, doctrines. And that's in verse 11. In regard to God's love for the brethren, it, your, your expression of God's love towards the brethren in verse 12, in verse 12, our third section, Paul is going to make concluding remarks about those unbelievers who are watching the church. I called it watching the church through the church windows. They're not coming in. They're looking to see whether or not they want to join or not. Verse 12. Let's go back to verse 12 because you missed it. See the word outsiders? so that you will behave properly towards outsiders and not be in any need. Outsiders, that's the people of the world. They're outside the church looking into the church, the body of Christ, seeing whether or not they would want to join. I don't know what age you got saved, but I didn't get saved till I was 23. I, I did a lot of looking <laughs> at it. What, what, was, what was I about to join? <laughs> I was an outsider looking in, and I guarantee you I looked at hard. I looked at it hard. 
So that's, that's the first thing. I want you to see how Paul is going to lay that thing out. It, 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 actually, the English translators laid it, laid it out. <clears throat> they laid it out wonderfully for us. In point number two, in section one, verses nine and ten, this is one Greek sentence. There are four main, there are four main verbs. We call them finite verbs in, in, uh, in, in uh, Greek. Four main verbs, and they're present active indicatives. Actually, actually, there's three. Let me show them to you. I wrote them down there. The fourth one is actually at, comes after Macedonia. Look, let me show you the three. You have, see, echo, present, active, and negative? That's a main verb, second person plural. There's a second one, for you yourselves are, I me, present, active, and negative. Then he goes to verse 10. Remember, we're going to stop after Macedonia with a period. Notice he says, you do practice, poieo, present, active, indicative, second person plural. Notice they're all second person plurals. These are three in the first sentence. That we probably ought to correct that. There are four, but there are only three in, the, in verse 9. But in verse 10, it makes four, right? But in verse 9 and 10, because it, it stops with Macedonia, there are three main verbs. Now look at the infinitives. He says, you have no need for anyone to write, working off the word, you have no need for anyone to write to you. Notice that's a present act infinitive. For your, you yourselves are... That's an absolute status quo verb of existence as a believer, present active indicative, taught by God to love. Notice that's a present active infinitive. Watch this now with a definite article. The word to, T-O, to, is a definite article. It's the word the. And the reason he put it there is that he is still talking about verse 9 the love that God has put in our hearts and is being expressed from our life to other lives of other believers and we're to excel, excel still more in it. Are you with me? One another. And then he says, or indeed do you practice poieto, present active addictive, second person plural, dealing with it, God's love, towards all the brethren, who are all in Macedonia, who are all in Macedonia, period. And then verse 10, I stop that at what I call 10A, and then 10B goes with 11, for we urge you, see the word urge, you brethren, to excel, notice the word excel is a present active infinitive. And it goes with the second Greek sentence, actually. Notice how the infinitives are playing off a main verb. So in section one, you have no need for anyone to write, that's the infinitive, to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Doctrinal point. Now, look at it. Now, I want you to take a moment. What doctrinal points would you write down there? What, what would you write? Whatever you want to write, write. You ought to write something. Because he believes that you have been taught enough doctrine to be able to put a doctrinal statement there. Let me read it again. L listen to what he says. You have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourself are taught by God to love one another. So what has God taught you about the love of God that should be expressed to others? What has he taught you doctrinally? Well, for me... He taught me there's a difference between milk doctrine on the love of God 
milk doctrine and meat doctrine. Hebrews 5, 13 and 14, we study milk and meat, right? And why, milk is for the baby believer and meat's for the mature believer. So a baby believer is going to approach, a, does he have the love? Of, listen here, here's what one doctrine should be. When did you get the love of God? How do I know that? Romans 5, 5. Right? A milk doctrine on loving the brothers, a milk doctrine, uh, Hebrews 5, 13, 14, a milk doctrine would be that you have the capability, once you are born again, you have the capability of loving another one, another human being with the love of God. Agreed? How come you didn't put that down? That's a milk doctrine. And I gave it to you prior to it. I know, because I, I, you know, because, you know, you forgot this is class. I mean, sometimes we give you a, qu a quiz in the beginning, right? You know, <laughs> sometimes the teacher gives a quiz in the beginning of the class, get your attention. Listen, you, a baby believer has the capacity under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.22, Romans 5.5 5 and Galatians 5.22, to love another human being with the love of God. Can, can you imagine that? Selfishly and unconditionally, agape. Selfishly and unconditionally, but not in the flesh. He can't do it in the flesh. He can only do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's true at every stage of his growth, not just as a, a baby believer, but an immature believer and a mature believer. Agreed? I'm not, I, I, when I ask that, I'm not asking for consent. I'm just saying you ought to, you ought to understand that. You ought to understand that. Because Paul is assuming that you've been taught, and I'm assuming I have taught you, that you ought to be able to put that down there. Now, a mature believer, when he approaches this subject, he approaches it from a whole different avenue of the maturity of God's love in his heart. God has proved to him since he was a baby believer that God loves him unselfishly and unconditionally. And it's that attitude that he's supposed to bring to the plate. John writes a whole book on this in 1 John. The whole first book, the whole, the whole book of 1 John is about that idea. And he really gets into it heavy when he gets into chapter 4 of 1 John. You should read that. Because he's asking you to love others in the way he has loved you unselfishly and unconditionally. Because we want to make mountains out of molehills all the time. Well, I'll tell you, I've taken my marbles and go home. I don't have to put up with you. I can go to any church. <laughs> any church? Not after he brings you the one that feeds your soul. There's no such thing as I can go to another church. Where, you get, where do you get that idea? It's not scriptural. Well, I'm going to take my toys and go someplace else. They don't want your toys. They want a healthy person that doesn't have to play kindergarten. They don't want a sick person to come to their congregation. They want healthy people, people who come ready to serve not with sour attitudes. Do you not understand this? That's how a mature believer deals with conflicts in his life. He deals with them the way God deals with him. God is merciful, right? He is forgiving. See, that's the meat side of love. That's the meat side, and he's going to deal with some of that today. But that's the meat side. 
I mean, how come that's not, how come those doctrines are not important to you that you could write them on? The, listen, the love of God that he's at, this ought to be down there. One of the characteristics of the essence of God is, is love. Would you agree with that? Have you been taught that? Yeah, there you go. That's the very essence about love that's in your life, and it was given to you by God. You don't have to conjure it up yourself. Agreed? You don't have to come up with your own idea of what is the love of God. He put it in your soul at the point of salvation. He put the essence of love inside your soul in Romans 5.5. And what he's asking you to, to do is to grow out of a baby into a mature person where he walks in the spirit all the time, not once in a while, and he can conduct himself with other people's behavior with the love of God. You know, people say, with the love of God, would you change, right? I hear people say it all the time, with the love of, for, for the love of God. If there's anybody able and capable to do that should be you as a meat eater. A meat eater. Is it, you know, is that a tough pill to swallow? It should be. It should not be. And so listen, what God has put in us that he's asking us to give to other people is the love of God. And listen, sometimes the love of God deals tough with us. Does the love of God, listen, listen, here's one that should be under that doctrine, on that, well, what doctrines you want to put down there? You ought to put, you ought to put Hebrews 5, uh, Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. Sometimes God has to deal with us and discipline us out of love, Right? Parental love, sometimes giving people parental love that is good for them is difficult for them to handle. Agreed? My, my, my. Well, you should. <laughs> he tells us in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, he tells us you should discipline your children the way God disciplines you. You should know how to discipline your children. You should discipline them with the love of God. That should be on your paper here. Plus a whole lot more. Paul, listen, how do, why, do, why are you doing that to me, Ron? Listen to what Paul did. Listen to what Paul did to us. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourself are taught by God to love one another, for indeed you do practice it, towards your, all the brethren who are in Macedonia. Now I'm going to ask you to excel in it. The only people who can excel in it are mature people. You've got to grow. You've got to grow in the way the love of God is expressed to you and from you. See, now is to the love of the brethren, right? Listen. In, verse, in the first part of verse 10, after the period at Macedonia, he says, but we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. I said, what are the doctrinal points? I'll tell you one that comes to my mind. The difference in the Christian life, the, still, still more, is di tapping into your maturity. You know, it's one thing to go, go to class and study and never, and listen, you don't get a diploma because you can't pass the test. You don't get a diploma because you go set in the class, right? Who's going to give you a, 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 God doesn't either. He, he brings testing to your life to exercise your faith in the word of God he's taught you. And you lay up for yourself treasures here and there. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you what's important. Here are doctrines to me that are important for you. Do you know the difference between the law of love, the law of expediency, and the law of supreme sacrifice? 
Do you know the difference? You should. That would go under that point. You know, you know what trumps the law of expediency? Law of love. You know what trumps the law of supreme sacrifice? Law of love. But do you know the difference? Do you not know that Paul taught that in 1 Corinthians? It looks like it's time for us to go back to Corinthians, isn't it? That would be important to me. The law of love, the law of love is directed towards believers. The law of expectancy, uh, expectancy uh, is towards unbelievers. And the law of supreme sacrifice is towards the Lord. Paul taught, taught about it in great length in 1 Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians. I'll tell you another one. If you're going to excel, excel still more, you're going to have to be, you're going to have to not look, just learn the faith cycle. You're going to have to learn to live it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing, believing, believing, applying, applying, completing. Romans 4.21. Those are some of the things I think about. What do you think about when the Bible's taught you? I mean, does God not, when you said there, does he, 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 does, does he not challenge you? I mean, he does me. I don't care who's preaching, if he's got the truth, I get challenged by it. I get inspired by it. It don't go in one ear and out the other. That's not why I come to church. I don't come to church to pay my dues or something. I come to church to learn. I want my relationship with the Lord to grow in such a way that it affects other people's life, not just my own. Point number three. In section two, that would be the first half of verse 10, which we just discussed, and now verse 11. In verse 11, he did something really unique. Look at verse 11. On, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, and attend to your own business, and work with your own hands. Those are what we call in the Greek language conjunctive, conjunctive, Conjunctions. I wrote it on your paper. And when they do, they hook up a bunch of things. They hook them up. They join. In this case, when it's used, and it could be anything in context, they're joining infinitives. I wrote on your paper. See the first one? And. Now, see, that's coming off, that's coming off of verse 10, the last part of verse 10. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still, still more. And th remember, this is a whole Greek sentence now. And to make. See, he started with. See, you can see the infinitives in the word to. To excel. To make. Uh, actually, you don't see the one. To attend. They got it. Attend to. Uh, and then to work. Those are all infinitives. And the conjunctive infinitive is really, used, really unique. And I wrote it in. Now remember the subject is love the brethren. The co adjunctive conjunction connects the infinitive to make it your ambition with the infinitive to lead a quiet life. And these are not two separate things. These are two things that are put together to make a doctrinal point. The con adjunctive <laughs> conjunctive pulls those two infinitive, it doesn't separate them, it pulls them together and links them. That's why the writers did it. And that's why they did it in the English. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. But there's two, there are, there are two infinitives connected together in this one doctrinal concept which is a problem-solving doctrine. You see that? 
Do you see that? And here's the doctrinal point he's making. Make it your ambition in your Christian life to lead a quiet life. There's two ideas in one doctrinal point. Make it your ambition as the divine will of God. See, see all of these, every infinitive that you see that Paul wrote on this paper, because it's a verbal noun working off the ideas of the main verbs, they are all divine wills. We call that the directive will of God. Every time, every infinite, there are eight of them. And every one of these eight are directing your attention with the word to, a directional, to a directive, a directive will of God on the subject of being able to excel in your love towards the brethren. Listen, people leave the church over that very issue. They stop coming to church over this very issue. That's not an issue you should ever leave the church over. In fact, this is the reason you should come to church and you should excel in the love of God when you're struggling with it. If you're struggling with the love of God, you're in the flesh. You're not in the spirit. Yes, but they hurt my feelings. Get over it. How they treat you is not how you treat them. If it was you, they never got saved. If God love, love for you had treated you that way, you'd have never got saved. Because God loved you in the worst state of your condition when he put his son on the cross to die for you. Let me tell you, you need to know when you're in the flesh and when you're in the spirit. Because the love of God doesn't work from your flesh. It works from your spirit, from the Holy Spirit of God. When the Holy Spirit produces love in most unloving conditions, you know you've arrived. Because God has done something out of your life that you could never do out of your life apart from God. Forgive somebody. Love them. Hug them. In the worst hour, hug them. Let me tell you, when Peter denied the Lord and the Lord walks out of the court condemned to go to the cross and he looks over and he sees Peter, I'll tell you what Peter saw in his eyes. He saw the love of God. That's not what Jesus saw in Peter's eye. It's not what Jesus saw in Peter's eye, but it's what, it's what Peter saw in Jesus' eye. I love you, son. I love you even though you betrayed me. Let me tell you, that's why Peter, in my opinion, that's why Peter wept the way he wept. And that's what people need to see in us. Can't be seen in the flesh. The flesh is, un, in, uh, the flesh is incapable of doing that. Incapable. It's incapable. The, per, the, the, the flesh cannot produce the love of God. That's religion, and it doesn't work. So he says, I want two attitudes in you. I want you to make it your ambition. I want to make, I want this, I want it to be your goal or your aim in dealing with people. Love the who? Come on, congregate. Love who? The brethren. Make it your aim, make it your goal. That's what he said in the word ambition. Make it your goal. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Be at peace within yourself and to love others in the midst of their mistakes. The mistake would be how they treat you. It's how they treat you.
love of the brethren. Make it. Now, remember, the word make it your ambition. Make it your goal or your aim. Make it your goal. To lead a quiet life, to be at peace within yourself, no matter what's going on around you. You know, if it wasn't for people, church would be great, wouldn't it? Well, the problem is you wouldn't have one. Because we, the people, are the church. Love of the brethren. And so what he does here, he takes these two ideas and puts them into one doctrinal concept. Make it your, make it your aim or your ambition or your goal to lead a quiet life. Don't stir up trouble and don't let trouble stir up you. They say it's a problem-solving device for conflict. And there's two ideas. You got you to set your mind. You got to set your goal to lead a quiet life. I'm not going to make trouble within my life. I'm not going to let trouble outside. I'm not going to let it get to me. I'm going to treat people the same way God treated me. I'm going to keep that standard bare in my life. Then he uses another adjunctive conjunction. And two, it doesn't have the word two in your Bible. It just says and attend, but it should be two. And two, that's, that, I didn't write adjunctive, but it's there. I didn't want to write it every time. I said there were three. This is the second. And to attend, paso, means to, means to perform or to practice to your own business. Isn't that interesting? And to attend to your own business. He puts it in a present active infinitive. Remember, that's a directive will of God. Mind your own business. Stop being a busybody. Don't gossip. All this comes off from that. Don't do that. Don't go around gossiping about people. Who's got time to do that? You ought to be witnessing to people. You ought to be uplifting people. You ought to be in prayer. You ought to be encouraging people who are down. Who's got time to be a busybody? Go around gossiping. I'll do that. And this is what the writer's talking about. And to attend to your own business. You know? Paul talks about two parts of your body get you in trouble. Your nose, stop being nosy. And your tongue, stop waggling. And the third point he makes, remember, these are all, listen, these infinitives are the directive will of God. They're problem-solving devices for conflict in a congregation. All right. And to work with your own hands, just as we commanded you. And so he puts another, to work with your own hands. You know, I don't know, when I was a kid, I grew up, they told us this all the time, the adults. Idle hands is what? Is the devil's workshop, right? I don't know if people tell you that anymore. My people weren't religious in the sense of religious. We weren't big church-going people. I heard that all the time. And man, go do your chores and do what you're supposed to do. You'll get in trouble. Listen, one of the things that you should be very much aware of out of this congregation is that work is a divine institution, employment. There are five divine institutions for all mankind. One of those is employment. You really need to know not just what it means to be a good worker, and you should work. Listen, jeez, I get
government should never pay people not to work. That's evil. It's evil. You should read Genesis, the third chapter, 17 through 19. Listen, the enemy out today is out to destroy all five divine institutions, out to destroy freedom. Is our freedom not up for grabs right now? Oh, my goodness. Marriage? Mama, my marriage between a man and a woman? By God's definition? Family? Employment? And nation identity? Do you know where boundaries come from? Genesis 10. Every nation has boundaries. You mess with the boundaries. Listen, e even our legal system deals with boundaries, right? You can't buy a piece of property and go like, well, I'll just, I have my boundaries. I just move my fence where I ought to move it, right? Some guy going to build a fence on his property. We're going to go talk about where it's going, right? It's not going to go five feet on my property. If it is, it's, I own it. <laughs> I mean, even our whole legal system is built on a, on a sense of justice. Boy, we're, and I don't know if you, 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 if you're a doctrinal person, you know that we're under enormous assault. By, by evil. Evil is no longer under the rug. It's no longer in the closet. It's in the university's teaching. It's in the White House, White House in the Senate, and the Congress. We're in mucho trouble. Open our borders to anybody who wants to come in. We're going to see we're going to see more warfare in our streets than you can possibly imagine from this. Open the gates and letting the enemy come in unchecked. You're going to see real violence. Listen, what's going on out there in in California and, and Oregon and and all of that goofiness? That'll be nothing compared to what you're going to see within a year. Four years from now, you won't recognize this. We're in a lot of trouble. And you people ought to know it. And listen, the only buffer zone between the rise of evil in the world is the church of Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians. The book of Thess Thess Thessalonians, the second Thessalonians book, teaches that it's the church of Jesus Christ in the last days that holds evil at bay. And listen, the doctrinal church is the last of the Mohicans. Hey, who's going to stand up and tell you the truth of the word of God, not play politics with you? Not to work for you for your money. My, my, my. Mm. And so, you know, on my paper, I'm talking about divine institution. They, he says, work with your own hands. So I put down, I, on my paper, I put the doctrine of employment, a divine institution of employment. We got the government. We got people cannot hire people to work and they're willing to pay them good money and they still won't work because they can't compete with the United States government. My, my, my. You talk about evil. I mean, that's evil in your face. And I tell you, you shouldn't be on the take. If you're a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you shouldn't be on the take. You send the money back. It ain't worth your soul. Get that money back. Tell them to do with it what they want. You are not for sale. My, my, my. We're, we're letting, the church is letting the nation go to hell. We've got to stop that stuff. We've got to start living and teaching and do what the word of God tells us to do. And here is a problem of sound advice in the church that goes all the way back to the first century. 
I know, I got all fired up. I got where I can't even watch the news anymore. I want to, I want to burst a hole through it. <laughs> but I'll tell you what it does. It drives me out to the streets to preach the gospel. I'll tell you, that's what it does. And I'll tell you, I've, I've discovered something wonderful. There are a lot of people interested in being saved. A lot of people interested if you just talk to them. Out in Moody, they walk into this young guy that we had here talking to you last week, Willie. They walk into his office and ask him, can you tell me how to be saved? They walk into his office. It's not uncommon to have three or four guys get saved a week out there just walking into his office. People are hungry for the Word of God. There, there are people that are just sick of the world and want a change in their life. I was, was you not? I was. I was sick to death of being sick to death. And so now he, he turns to conjunctions. And I got to quit. Where am I? I got to quit, don't I? What time is it out there? You know, I got a clock back there. It's about as big as the wall, and I still can't see it. 1030. Well, look, you're going to have to do point four. I want you to pay attention to the subjunctives. And when you find a subjunctive, I want you to understand contingency. A subjunctive mood is always pointing you back something you have just learned from verse 9, 10, and 11 that makes this contingent. In other words, this will come to pass when, you, when that's done. You know, I've been in a pulpit so many years, I still don't think I have enough material when I come. <laughs> I still, in my mind, I think, well, you better do more. <laughs> you think I, I could learn that, but I, I don't. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come today by the automobile and the internet. I pray, Father, I know that we've got a lot of language because Paul gave it to us. He wrote it in the Greek. And boy, was it powerful, Father. For me, trying to bring it out in the simplicity, I pray the Holy Spirit would take the thoughts and intents of my heart along with Paul's and smooth it out and make it sensible in the lives of these people that have come today to listen to us. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.